An intensifying debate on whether Muslims can coexist with a liberal Western society. Okay, uh, stuff, uh, a lot of stuff incoming on the show today for this wide-ranging convo that we're having with Lawrence. Uh, Michael in New York, thank you very much for uh, writing in here. Michael asks uh, Lawrence, he says, referring to your comments on China, U.S. policies feeding the oligarchy. China fortunately has massive reserves, but how much longer can America play this game with their monopoly currency? Do you see, and this is a perennial question, a, a, a massive dumping or sell-down of treasuries at some point? Pretty hard when you ho hold close to a billion dollars worth of them, right? You'd be shooting yourself in the foot, really. I think it's unrealistic for China to have a massive sale of the treasuries. And of course, one of the sort of threats is that if suddenly we start to print money, mm -hmm. then their assets will be worthless. So you have this kind of uh, standoff between both countries. The reality is both countries are now mutually dependent. They're feeding upon each mm -hmm. other's own stimulus packages. China's buying U.S. treasuries. There's nothing else better to buy right now. Uh, they're doing some diversification into European instruments, but it's not that much if you think about it. And of course, China is to a great extent with its own stimulus package is burning the money on infrastructure, investment to try and stabilize its society, keep people working. Mm -hmm. At the same time, China's betting on a U.S. recovery, betting that consumption is going to return to its old levels because China's massive foreign exchange reserves have been dependent upon two sources. One is inbound foreign investment, which is now shrinking because we don't have money to invest elsewhere. We're going back home with our money. Mm -hmm. Second is exports, which are shrinking as well because Americans, Europeans are kind of consuming what they used to consume before. Mm -hmm. So it's a catch-22. Both are linked. Yeah, but they do keep calling, just a little, for a little bit more on that subject, they do talk about, you know, that there is a certain fatigue and, that, you know, it's getting a little tiring for a lot of economies to be so addicted to the dollar. They, I mean, it's just, it, in many ways, it's so irrelevant because trade is settled between the Brazilians and the, and the Chinese. They're like, why do we have to do, do business with Th the dollar? That's already changing. I mean, yeah. China itself is starting to do, you know, cross-swap agreements with its neighbors, neighboring countries. They're nailing like, them one by one. Sure. Yeah. Myanmar, yeah. Laos, sure. Vietnam, mm -hmm. Central Asian states bordering China. You can use the renminbi. You can use the yuan currency right there. You can swap right in-house, in, 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 house, in mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it's natural for them to do cross-swap agreements, settlement agreements. And, of course, uh, they're asking for a greater role in the UN. I mean, the uh, proposal uh, came up late last year for SDR, special drawing rights of the IMF, mm -hmm. to have yen. Yen is one of the basket of currencies. And in turn, China is asking for a greater role in the IMF, greater role in you know, these institutions. If mm -hmm. it doesn't get that role, mm -hmm. then the yen is going to be a competitive currency. Okay. I mean, this is, this, is, this is in process now. The game's on. Yeah, it's going on, and it's gonna, they're doing it themselves in the absence of full convertibility, clearly. That's right. Um, Andre writes in, and uh, you know uh, Jim Cramer, uh, the uh, very loud uh, presenter on a rival network, said China is more capitalist than the U.S. Is it true? In your view, depends how you define capitalism. But I would say that how China, do you define capitalism? I can't define it anymore. I thought <laughs> well, I used to. We always to be able talk to. about capitalism being, you know, Adam Smith and the invisible hand, yeah. meaning that greed drives all and that greed will, will, will make all markets you know, reach a state of equilibrium because people are driven by the invisible hand of greed. I, I don't agree with that. I think people are more than that. You know, they are, people are more than in statistics and they're driven by many factors, spirituality, quality of life, heritage, culture. There are many things that drive people, not just greed. So we have to reassess our assumption of what is capitalism. We should have more compassionate vision of capitalism. I call it compassionate capitalism. But in the case of China, yes, it is driven by greed. Mm. That is the main mindset of people. And in many ways, China has adopted today a kind of, even though it has a one-party state called the Communist Party, mm. in practice, it is a absolutely capitalist. It's a kind of Dickinsonian free-for-all capitalism, mm. something that we may have known, you know, the earlier stages of our own industrial revolution. Yeah, I would, uh, I, I would fear for my safety in a 100 percent capitalistic kind of environment, to be honest with it, you. It is hands-barred capitalism right now. Yeah. Uh, on, on, as a follow-up to that, Terrell writes in, in your regionalization scenario, who would police the world? If America can no longer afford to fight all the wars, you know, protect emerging democracies from the bad guys. Is there, is there, who would, who would be the big policeman 
if this were well, the case. Well, who are the bad guys? And I think people are being tired of being policed, and they're being tired of fighting wars that are basically being syndicated to other countries. They don't seem to pay off. They don't the, seem the, the resolution doesn't come. Yeah, anymore. we're not getting anywhere with the wars. Of course, it, you know, it, it helps the industrial state. It helps you know a lot of corporations that make money from wars and the defense establishment. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's actually getting anywhere in terms of the principles that are trying to be solved. I think we would do more to solve terrorism in developing countries in Central Asia, Middle East, and Southeast Asia if we were working more with microfinance, trying to mm. do more to empower people with the means to support themselves, giving people back their identity, yeah. and stop demonizing them in the media. I yeah. mean, really, you know, you have to have a more diversified approach, and war is not going to get us. Well, we're talking us. about a case-by-case case study. I mean, this was part of the Obama doctrine coming in, is you can't have a war on terror because it's an abstract concept, you know? There isn't a big thing called terror out there. You have this discontent, that discontent here and there. I don't know. We have to bring the marginalized people in from the coal, bring them into the mainstream. That's going to need economic development. It's going to need mm -hmm. to also empower people back with their own identity. We have mm -hmm. to stop demonizing and marginalism. This is what I call the Himalayan consensus alternative okay. to the Washington consensus. And we have talked about that. We don't have time to talk about that today because we had a very a subject very, very dear to my heart and also Lawrence's heart as well because we're talking about the state of the world and what we've been doing to it and how, you know, extreme levels of consumption are just going to make the lifespan of the world shorter. Still to come, they're diplomats of the sea, smiling all the time. So.